And I want to jump into the issue of peer reviews, um, both because they're in an area of needed growth for your projects, but also because they are one of the, the top three or four most important best practices within the software area, particularly in their form of inspections. Okay. Um, and uh, it's shocking how valuable peer review can be when used to its greatest effects. And it's for multiple reasons. What are some of the benefits that peer review might bring to a project? Yeah, um, Matt? Good. And, and having multiple eyes on that, what concrete benefits does that, that give? Give me one of them. Okay, so you have multiple eyes. It can help spot errors, right? Okay, maybe that's what you're thinking of, having multiple sets of eyes. But another thing that happens in reverse is kind of learning, right? Like different parties learn what's going on in that area of the system. Oh, that's how you do that. Or that's how it works. Or you mean you're depending on that? I was about to get rid of that in the system or something like that. So it can be really helpful for, for others learning about how parts of the system work. What else, what other sort of, whoa, whoa. Um, other sort of learning could that help? Yeah. Uh, maybe uh, James. James, okay. Uh, maybe someone else on the team knows that uh, more efficient or a better way to do something. Totally, totally. So it, it allows for sharing of expertise on, on sort of how to do things better. And it can be as, you know, it can be more profound computationally like a better algorithm or you know, a more paralyzable way of, of performing this um, that would allow for exploitation of GPUs or you know, allow for um, uh, faster, lower memory footprint to allow your system to have less risk of being ejected by iOS or Android for memory. But it can also be very important other features like stylistic issues, naming conventions, um, to ensure that those who look at the code can better understand it, better reason about it, it's, it's more transparent, in short, better use it, use it more reliably and less risk of error down the road. So it's not just about finding bugs now, it's about preventing bugs in the future through understanding. And most, I wanna hit on something I said there that may not have struck you as significant, but it's incredibly significant. When we think about the role in quality assurance of on the one hand, testing, and on the other, peer review. In any of its forms, pair programming, informal desktop walk, uh, desktop, um, so pure desk check, um, a walkthrough of a delivery of work, um, a formal team team uh, inspect a team uh, meeting team review, or an inspection. Testing versus peer review, and I clump all these with peer review um, together for this purpose. Okay, um, testing identifies anyone it begins with an F. It has a U in it. It's a thing students try to avoid. Yeah. <laughs> failures. It detects failures. Who is it? So this detects failures. Right? So your test finds that the system puts up a, you know, a dialog indicating that there is an error, or it, it returns the wrong thing from calling this function in a unit test calling it from a harness, or it, you know, it, it crashes the system, right? That's a failure. Or the system hangs. Um, or, or, you know, the, the update rate for the Oculus gets so slow that, you know, one is convulsed into early stage nausea 
by, by looking at it, and you have to take off your, your headset. Um, um, I won't try to be too florid, but um, that's another sign of failure. Um, these are failures um, of various sorts. How do we figure out the, because what underlies the failure? The, the actual fault, the underlying sort of technical problem that gives rise to these failures, be it a, you know, an inefficient algorithm that can't be mapped to the GPU processing pipeline for Oculus or, or you know, some JavaScript bug that does something, uh, don't get me started, um, but going from fault to failure. Who finds the fault? What's this process of going from a failure once it's observed to the fault called? It's called Debugging. It's debugging, right? Debugging figures out, so this is sort of causal arrow here. Um, and this uh, debugging deduces the fault underlying the failure, right? Um, so it allows us to zero in uh, uh, on this fault and fix it, right? Deduces and fixes, right? Testing can take a while. Particularly manual tests take particularly long. Uh, automated tests through a UI are, are no you know, rocket ship either. Um, debugging takes human time. It's a very, it's a human activity. It takes time to go find the bug. This, this um, takes a long time. When we say, to use Matt's comment, we have many eyes on the system. Um, <laughs> failure, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> um, it's actually, I'm, I'm running virtual box. It's a, it's a, it's a you know, a virtualized, a system on my Linux box, and it interacts weirdly with Microsoft's anti-counterfeiting logic, um, and that comes up periodically. Moment, get rid of it. Um, peer review. When I say there's many eyes on the code, what do those eyes, Matt, see when successful? When when they they see with acuity, what do they pick up? problems that arise. In short, they pick up faults. They identify faults or likely faults, mistakes in logic, for example. Um, conditions which work under most cases but don't handle some corner case or don't correctly operate in the presence of low memory or exhausted memory or don't deal with a disk full error or you know, can't handle uh, uh, a, a bad, a badly formatted user file name. They don't handle a file not found thing when the user, you know, tries to select a file that's now been deleted, or they, or their security vulnerabilities. Right? They they allow a user to enter a, a string in the search box for your web form, and then they just directly turn that into a string to pass to the database, therefore allowing SQL injection techniques. Right? Or they support, they, they are vulnerable to cross-side scripting, whatever. But they, what you spot is actually false. So you cut to the chase. You don't actually go detect a failure and then have to say, well, what led to this failure? And, and find the fault. You actually, through peer review, you identify the faults directly. Or potential faults, you know. And, and there lies an important observation. If I say potential faults, how might we confirm whether this is a fault? We, we think, I don't think this is gonna, I don't think this is gonna work correctly under these, these cases. What can we do to test, the, to, to test that? We could write some tests. So it turns out peer review and inspection, far from being alternatives to each other, really help each other. Peer review can inspect tests. Peer review can motivate tests. Testing can help validate 
the results of suspicions in peer review. And, and testing can test certain types of things that peer review would, it, it, it would require a lot to sort of um, uh, develop, develop the level of confidence you might get from a few tests. So these are some of the reasons. And for these, for these reasons, among many others, peer reviews is, is a key best practice. So here's the, here's the, the straight up basic comments on value here. Peer reviews have been shown by a number of studies to find a larger fraction of bugs than testing can. So of all the defects out there, the faults, we can actually find a larger subset of them with peer review than testing. Okay, so here are all our defects. Okay. Um, and with peer review, we're able to capture a larger set than we can with, with, with testing. But not only that, it's more cost effective. In terms of human effort per defect found, it's much more efficient by like an order of magnitude than, than is testing. So testing requires a lot more time per defect found. Why? Why does it require a lot more time per defect found? Why is testing so labor intensive? Well, I'll tell you one type of testing is very labor intensive. It's manual testing, that's true. But, but this is reflecting a lot of automated tests. Why is that so labor intensive? Yes? Is it because um, Camille? Camille, yeah. You might have a bug in your testing. So, like, you have to yeah. test your testing. You have to test your testing. Sometimes your tests don't work. You have to debug your tests. Sometimes you write tests for your tests. Um, so, that's good. It's absolutely good. What else happens as software evolves? Yes, well. That's right. That's right. So this is actually, though, not so. So it's a very good point. Absolutely salient. Very important. But this statistic actually ignores the time for debugging. This is actually finding. They're actually dealing. I, I believe this study actually deals with like when they say a bug found, it's like you observed a failure. And they just leave it like that. There's not even deal with the fault side in computing the human time at fault. Yeah. Tests need to be implemented and then maintained. Yes, they have to be maintained. And one of the things that makes them challenging to maintain is the fact that software evolves. Software evolves over time, code bases evolve, and tests that work with those code bases evolve, <coughs> user interfaces evolve, and tests that depend on those user interfaces, whether manual or automated. Have to evolve. Mm -hmm. um, so peer reviews are cheaper per, in terms of hours per defect found. They cut to the heart of finding the defects, and they find a larger fraction of bugs or defects than are located through failures found by testing. I'll put it that way. They're also more flexible than testing. Why are they more flexible? Why are they more flexible than testing? Well, because, yeah, yeah. Uh, you don't need any software or test runners for to write them? Uh, exactly. You don't need software, you don't need code to be written. It's hard to run tests if code isn't there. Right, what are, you, what are you testing? But you sure can start reviewing early on. I had rattled off some things you can re re review. What are some of those? Requirements document, another. Risk. Risk document, another. Testing plans, another. Design document about sort of division of responsibility. I'm not asking for anything 
fancy there, but generally it helps your team if they have some sense what different areas of the code are responsible for, what, what, what spheres of responsibility. Um, and all those things can be inspected early on. Division of responsibilities within the team. Who's responsible for what and the plan for successive IDs. These are all things that can be, can be inspected. So you don't have to wait for things. And you spread knowledge around by peer reviews. You run those tests, automated tests, and there's not a lot of learning going on by the people on the team. You run peer reviews, there's a huge amount of learning often t taking place. Clarity, style, commenting, issues of, of how the different pieces of the system work and, and uh, how they need to serve the rest of the system. Okay, um, so peer reviews offer benefits to the person reviewing the artifacts, clarifying. Person who's reviewing it allows clarifying, the understanding, coding tricks, stylistic ideas. Person, you know, they, they learn how React works, perhaps. They get a better understanding of, you know, how does React and Redux work together to achieve, you know, uh, state-based routing or what have you. Um, uh, it also benefits the person whose artifact is being reviewed. Look, I mean, they, they get suggestions so they can improve their code. Okay, they can make it more robust. So they, they learn at the basic level about that, but they also learn about the needs of the remainder of the system because Others who are authors of different parts of the system that interface with this may say, you know, you're doing something there that won't work with three of the cases I need you to handle. I call this code and it's not going to be able to handle these three cases. Or this works fine now, but for, the, uh, for next ID, you know, um, our UI is going to need to show this box and you can't provide me the information that I need to populate the text in that box or what have you, um, to do this updated visualization or what have you. And it, look, it spreads knowledge with the code base, written standards um, for the team or coding styles. And finally, I say code is written with other people in mind. What do I mean by that? It's actually a notable psychological thing. Yeah, basically. <laughs> That's right. If your code, if you're the only consumer of your code, you might be willing to let things slide. But if you know that within the next week, there's going to be a group of your peers on the team who are going to be going over this code and critiquing it or making suggestions how it could be improved, analyzing its correctness, chances are you'll spend a, that little bit of extra time at least to you know, hold your head high in that meeting. Just to feel like you've, you've lived up to your side of the bargain. Okay, um, okay. early reviews. I, I mentioned them before. These are, are some components. Um, lots, lots there. Uh, and, you know, if this were a, a project in the commercial world, where there might be not just a proje project manager, but a, um, a manager who handles the product side. So not just the technical side, but sort of productizing it or, and, and, and helping promote it or what have you, uh, documents of relevance there. So there's all these different stages. I'm gonna be including some, some diagrams here that are from Carl Weger's excellent book, Peer Reviews and Software, which, which I, I you know, really find very helpful in this sphere. It's kind of my go-to book in this sphere. And he identifies, Readers does, um, a variety of stages um, at the testing level, at the UI level, um, you know, for usability issues, architectural issues that could form the basis for peer reviews. And many of them early on for things like this, okay? Um, now, <laughs> I want to focus, so your teams, um, and I think this is true for both teams, have at this point engaged in some good pair programming or you know side-by-side -side work within the team. That's excellent. I'm, I'm happy to see that. That's very important. It's to be assumed. It's a requirement of this course that you engage in quite a bit of that, and I'm happy to see the teams deliver on it. 
But where I saw ID1 fall a bit short of its potential was in multi-person reviews, um, and particularly formal multi-person reviews. So I want to spend a little bit more time on my comments here in the limited available time to sort of hammer home some, some guidelines for these sorts of reviews. Um, okay, so the goal is to, to have a review that has three to seven participants there. Um, should be kept focused on an artifact. You're not reviewing your peer. You are engaged in a peer review in the sense of uh, involved. You're taking peers, bringing to the table to review an artifact, a, a, a technical, technical artifact. Maybe it's a UI plan or some usability document. Maybe it's, it's some testing plan or maybe it's a requirement spec. Um, in the meeting, the goal is uh, not to solve the problems. This often takes more time than you have. But to try to identify problems or possible problems. Um, generally, people get burnt out over two hours um, when it's over two hours, and I don't recommend that. This is one of the reasons why I'm pleased to say that I've never taught a class here at the U of S that, that is over an hour and a half long, because I think it's really hard for students to concentrate for like those three hour blocks you sometimes see. You know, three hours on Thursday night or something that, uh, that seem to be done increasingly frequently. Um, and, uh, and so, you know, you want to keep it to, to two hours. Um, for formal reviews, which I'm going to be emphasizing because uh, those are the requirements for this course, the formal inspections, generally there's prep ahead of time. When I say advanced, I don't mean that you have your PhD hat on. What I mean by advanced is it's advanced in advance of the meeting, okay? Um, and like for all of my work, I try to, I try to mix um, a healthy respect and emphasis on the human factor side as well as the rigorous technological components. This is not merely a technological exercise. This isn't a transactional thing where you zero in on the defects and you say, go off and fix it. This, you, know, you have to be um, sensitive to uh, the fact that you're, you're working with a peer in a way that can, that can risk defensiveness when you're finding issues. And so it needs to be phrased in a way that, that avoids pushing buttons, avoids red flags, avoids you know, setting them off and setting up adversarial reviewer, reviewee types of um, dynamics. And uh, there's a lot compressed into that sentence. Um, but we, we circulate as software engineers not only the technical but also the human sphere. And we need, to, we need to undertake this review in a respectful way, in a way that is attentive to the, how easy it is for all of us to get defensive, um, and, uh, and that doesn't unnecessarily, doesn't engage in unnecessarily adverse things or rubbing things in or smirking and that sort of thing. Um, uh, things could go off the rails. I know two times in the history of this course, roughly, where you know people have walked out of meetings and have got huffy and you know um, have engaged. Maybe it's three times now. Um, over fourteen years, that ain't a bad batting record. But we can do better. And those times, you know, one could have uh, finessed it better. Um, and, and the issue here is to prioritize. We have limited time and we have to prioritize just like with this lecture. Okay, who should be at that meeting? Okay, so if we had three to seven, who should be there? Well, look, as the person who wrote the item, the, oh, yes, um, can, uh, Bronson. Bronson. Yeah. can you clarify what the advanced preparations would be? Yeah, um, so I actually have a slide on that later. But basically it's circulating ahead of time information on what will be reviewed so that people have a chance to review it before the meeting, right? And the meeting's going to be a lot more effective if people aren't encountering the item to be reviewed for the first time, like right there in front of them. And they're saying, so what is this? And how does this fit in? And uh, It's much better if you could circulate that ahead of time with some description of, okay, where does this piece fit in the system? You know, is it 
Is it new because of some recent, um, recent changes? Does it meet certain requirements? If you can circulate some basic context and motivation, like a day or two ahead, to give someone an hour or two before the meeting to look it over and gather some thoughts, that meeting will be a lot more effective. You'll get a lot more substance out of that meeting than you will if you're just encountering it for the first time right there. Not to say you won't get anything out if you're encountering it for the first time at the spot, but that time will be a lot better spent you know, if you had a chance to, to review it ahead of time. Um, so other people kept up in that meeting are, uh, you know, someone wrote the, an earlier version of this, maybe having them there. Um, the author of other things that depend on this code, maybe including tests, or other, other items that interact with this code or this area of the system. Have those folks that is, so they can offer particular, particularly relevant feedback. Okay. Um, so there's a spectrum which for the sake of simplicity, I'll treat as one dimensional here, of levels of formality. Um, from all the way here on the right, or left if I face you, um, ad hoc review. Um, hey, can you take a look at this? What do you think? Um, uh, I think I'm handling this, this right. Is this how you do things when, you know, is this how you signal an error in the UI context or what have you? all the way down to a formal inspection. And there's a variety of ones in the middle, okay? Um, uh, and the issue is not the names. The names uh, will be good to keep in mind. Um, enough of them are standardized, like inspection or pair programming, um, that they're familiar terms in the software industry. It'd be good to know them, um, a pure desk check. But uh, others vary not a little bit. Let's, let's talk about at a functional level, how do these differ? Like, names aside, how do they differ from one another? Well, look, um, I'm not gonna go through this exhaustively, um, but the different review types shown here on the left, um, to the different aspects of those reviews uh, on the left, match to the different review types shown along here um, on the, the x-axis going there at the top in different ways. For example, uh, an ad hoc review, which is like the least formal of the reviews. There's no advanced planning or preparation. Okay? There's no pre-scheduling of the meeting. There's no circulation of a work package prior to that meeting. Say, hey, look at this before the meeting. Um, there is a meeting in person. Um, uh, there's corrections often made on the spot, but there's no, there's corrections suggested, but there's no verification that they took place. It's like, oh, I don't, I don't think that's going to work with, um, you know, the, the latest version of this UI or what have you. Um, something like uh, pair programming has, you know, some, some planning, you, you have people who, who want to get together, um, perhaps for a certain time, they, they coordinate. Sometimes it's spontaneous. Um, this kind of an ongoing meeting, uh, this correction often made, uh, identified and made right at the spot. And inspection, you'll notice, is across the board, yes. It involves all of these. So we'll be, we'll be focusing on some aspects of these. But this is just one way to subdivide it, to slice and dice it, okay? Um, this is one, projection to make on this axis uh, of, of these different characteristics. Another way is to talk about, we'll focus in on multi-person meetings. These are what I call more formal, but they, they happen to be the ones that involve multiple people. And there's three basic types, inspections, team reviews, and workflows, and, and work on walkthroughs, okay? Um, an important distinction for inspection is that Typically, the leader of the inspection is a moderator. It's someone whose job it is. We have people in specific roles, okay? Um, particular participant roles for this. Someone is a moderator, and their job is to sort of, um, you know, put the meaning through in its various stages, make sure that it 
that it's, um, it's meeting its objective, maybe that it gets in on time, et cetera, that you're making good progress. The person who presents an inspection, when interpreted in its most rigorous way, is actually not the author of the artifact. It's a so-called reader. It's someone who's taken on the responsibility of studying it and characterizes it while the author is right nearby, but the reader presents it. I'm not going to require that for you. For your formal inspections, you're welcome to use the author, which would make them a little bit closer to team review um, uh, as, as defined here. Okay. Um, having a reader present it can make it less risk at risk of getting personal. Um, uh, it also forces someone to study it carefully and characterize it from a different perspective. Um, and uh, is a technique used in many, uh, many other areas, um, including academic conferences. Um, but uh, it is something which requires someone to, to take it on. Um, for inspections, there's a formal report, someone who records what has been found. Um, and there uh, is a defect checklist which comes out of it, which basically indicates what has to be fixed. And that recorder is typically recording, okay, these are the items that we identified as needing checking into or fixes, okay? Um, and uh, that will form an important part of later verification that things have been, um, been, been checked through and resolved, okay? Um, so a walkthrough is the sort of more um, more relaxed version of that. It's the most relaxed version where it's definitely the author presenting. Um, and, you know, maybe there, there is or is not a recorder uh, present, and uh, there may not, not even be formal roles. It's kind of a bunch of people getting together and talking and putting their heads together to, to analyze this. Okay? So this is um, inspections. And I make some comments here about cutting to the chase, about how those differ from each other. Okay, um, uh, for uh, for several some of these reviews, including walkthrough and, and team review. Um, okay, inspections best practices. Although I'm not going to enforce all aspects of inspections, these best practices are very useful. Um, look, um, first few inspections. Make sure you don't leave money on the table by failing to inspect your. Um, you know your your requirements uh, documentation or or a, a technical um, specification a a, uh, a description of the design for your system. Um, focus these reviews on major defects. Uh, inspections compared to walkthroughs typically go through less material. They go through like a couple, you know, it could be as little as like a couple dozen lines of a tricky uh, area of the code base. No more than like. 100 to 200 lines of code, max, you know, class or what have you. Um, a focus on, on major, major defects. Um, you can spend your time, you know, twiddling your thumbs and navel gazing and just, just suggesting little things, but, you know, you want to get the best mileage you can out of this. Um, so if you know there are serious performance issues, Focus in on, on them, for example, as, as something that's, that's major. Um, uh, you're going to want to be thinking about, like, how, you know, is there a way we, we could find errors like this in the future? Because you're finding faults. How could we have prevented that fault from coming about? How could we have detected it earlier? Uh, one of the principles of the class I keep on coming back to. Um, uh, and, you know, you, you want to. Uh, Check the the documents uh, against if 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 you're not inspecting something that is source code to the degree there is something behind it. Like you have a bunch of tests, you might want to check to make sure that they're consistent with the, the code that they're uh, referring to. So you might check related documents that that relate to that. Um, uh, don't try to go too fast uh, because you'll get less benefits out. Uh, and you know, try to keep track of how many defects you found. Let me know.
Let me know how many defects you found or potential defects. That's really, really valuable. Um, if you find more, I will view that as a sign of an effective uh, inspection, not as a quality problem. Okay? Um, so there's a balance between here having too many inspectors and too few. Um, more inspectors may catch greater bugs, um, but it can make it hard to schedule and it can slow the progress. Um, so sometimes people might do several inspections uh, in parallel or you know, at different times rather than one big one. Okay. Um, so generally this is from a, a colleague, Fedyoski Kanamora, um, uh, that you know, who, who describes sort of the orientation meeting. Sometimes there's an orientation meeting where things are discussed ahead of time to some prep by people. This orientation meeting might give some some understanding of the, the test, why it's important, what to look for, what the major concerns are about this code review meeting and then some rework and then they iterate sometime. I'm not going to hold you responsible for all of this, but it's something you see with with formal inspections. Um, okay, so earlier it was asked, what do people do ahead of time with these? Well, one thing is planning, okay? So participants generally review material on their own before. This is the preparation. Before the meeting, they're reviewing material to be presented at the meeting, to allow that meeting to be to achieve more. Right? Um, the moderator is assigned often ahead of time. Um, the author might suggest uh, major objectives for inspection. They know this area of the code reasoning may not be quite accurate in light of recent changes or plan changes to the code base, or they're concerned about performance and this algorithm or what have you. Um, and sometimes there's multiple meetings. The moderator will take care of the kind of choreography of inviting people, prep of the package, and distribution of the package at least a day or two uh, ahead, ideally several days ahead. Okay. So look, if you're going to do an inspection, make use of it. Make it go the furthest you can. And this requires a little bit of prep. But it's time that often is free in the sense that it pays itself back. Um, Sometimes there's an overview meeting. I'm not going to require you to do that. But like ahead of time, you discuss what are we going to be doing in the main meeting? What are our objectives, et cetera? Um, here's the, the prep. Um, so these might be things you include in the prep to, to address Bronson's question. Uh, so you might include, well, obviously, what you're going to be talking about at the meeting. That, that, Artifact by itself. Maybe it's a test plan. Maybe it's a requirements document. Maybe it's the, you know, some section of code, right? Um, risk document. But maybe there's some things you want to consider. If it's code, maybe you have a standards document for coding style, for naming conventions, for issues having to do with indentation, for issues having to do with how big code blocks should be, or what have you, comments, commenting style, what have you. Um, uh, there, there may be some specifications that you refer people to, you know, background on how to use Redux so that they, when they review this React code, they have some understanding of, of the system that it's, it's using for some of its uh, management of state. Um, you might also include a an issue log that people fill out. This is generally good practice. We do these types of reviews. We've done them many times in my group. And one of the things we do is ahead of time we distribute an issue log. And so if people in the prep are looking through the deliverable and thinking about what are some, is this an issue? Is that an issue? I'm not sure how this works. They can write it down in the issue log ahead of time. And then they bring that issue log to the actual meeting, and they can ask questions of the reader and author, okay? So, so here, they're actually doing work ahead so that the actual meeting, they're bringing up substantive issues together with the author and getting these issues addressed. So it goes a lot further, okay? Um, and you know, potentially, if, if you have code, test documents. What, what has this code been tested against? Maybe you think 
There's no way this is going to work. No way this is going to work in this case. But maybe there's a set of tests that you're shown that actually verify, no, it, I'm passing these tests. And that makes you say, okay, I've got to think about this more. I, I, you know, I must be misunderstanding something. Um, right. Uh, okay. Um, participant roles, well, I commented on this earlier. Um, I'm not going to go through this again. But basically, there's the author, the moderator, the readers, um, the, the reader who presents the code. Um, and inspectors are several people. Sometimes they overlap with you know, the person who's keeping the time or the reader. Um, uh, and, and it can include you know, the author, actually. Um, they can critique the code and identify possibilities. You want to allow the author to say, yeah, this really needs to be fixed, or you know, now that I think about it, there's a problem here for future expansion. We're planning to add this new feature on, and this will never handle it. And you allow them to contribute. Um, they're not merely in the background here. They're not on trial or something. Um, and there's a recorder, um, recorder here. Okay. Um, I would suggest doing these with three to four participants, but you're welcome to do it more. Now, the, a key thing is for inspection, you come out with an issues document, a set of issues that need to be looked into or resolved. And typically, there's so-called rework needed. There's work needed to change the deliverable to accommodate or account for or resolve these issues that have been found. found. Um, so the author is basically working at this stage to deal with the issues that were found in inspection or its prep. Um, and some of them might get assigned to others. You know, like this test doesn't, this test is testing nothing. So you're inspecting this code, you get circulated several of the tests and you find that one of them Maybe it used to be meaningful, but these days it's not testing anything significant uh, of any significance uh, based on the changes to the code base. And so maybe removal of that test gets assigned to a tester, or maybe you know how it tests that has to be updated or what have you. Um, and uh, you know sometimes you just put into the issue tracking log these defects to be. Uh, um, to be fixed, okay? Now, in formal inspections as practiced in industry, often this rework will itself be verified later by a follow-up stage, okay? The moderator, in their final task in this process, they'll check, yeah, have the issues been resolved, okay? And then, you know, the code can be committed to the source code control system like Git. Um, or subversion or what have you. So basically this is just to make sure, yeah, you fix the things. So it doesn't, it's not just a loose end, not just something that drags out, okay? Um, okay. Um, so what am I expecting of you here? Well, I mentioned throughout the term, I'm expecting some sorts of peer reviews. And you folks have started on those and some of you have started them really on earnest. So this include pair programming, pair testing, pair debugging I put in there, pure desk checks where you run something by one of the members of your code, that's great. Or where you have an informal walkthrough, maybe at a team meeting, you know, this is what I'm thinking about submitting for the deliverable for my risk document. What do you think? Are there any things missing? That's great. That's at the top. Okay. That's, that's all sort of some informal peer reviews taking place. Really important. Really valuable. But the bottom, because it's an industry best practice, because those statistics that I mentioned at the beginning here, these were based on inspection. Okay, so, so this order, almost order of magnitude difference between the efficiency of testing per human hour 
versus what's found in peer review is specific for inspection. Inspection is viewed as an industry best practice. The other peer review is incredibly valuable. But inspection is, is used as like this, this um, you know, it's not a silver bullet, but it's an extremely effective tool. It's known to be very, very powerful, and powerful beyond what testing can achieve. Um, if you had to choose between the, the two, and you could really peer review your code base or test your code base, you'd, you'd peer review it. You're finding the faults, you're spreading the knowledge, you're identifying the issues, you're you're, you're building up quality, you're getting people to expect their code to be scrutinized. Um, you, you, do, you do peer review. Teams who, have, who, who fear a test deficit because of testability challenges invest in peer review. These statistics are for inspections and for that reason, I do require one inspection of an artifact for the semester. Okay. Um, so let me let me rephrase that because that's terribly ambiguous. For each person in the team, one of their artifacts has to be inspected. Um, at least one of their they, they have to undergo an inspection of at least one of their artifacts throughout the semester. Okay. Um, I would encourage them to participate in inspections of several other artifacts. In fact, by the pigeonhole principle, it's hard to imagine that not happening. Um, but um, I don't know if I've that, that humor, but, um, but it's true. Um, uh, so so I, would, I would expect that you participate in several inspections as a reader, or as a moderator, or as a recorder, or whatever. Um, hopefully as an inspector, um, most of them can also be inspectors, but, um, but you know, I do expect each of you to have undergone some formal inspection of, of, of an artifact you created. Um, and reporting on that. And letting us know, myself and Dale here, know ahead of time, where possible, where you're doing inspections. Um, uh, wherever possible, please let us know ahead of time because we're interested in observing. If you can, drop by, make some suggestions on the process, see how it's going, uh, would be good. Okay? Now I want to bring back in the final three minutes here our attention though to a key point. I had said earlier in a flirt that if you had to choose between peer review and testing, then you would choose peer review. And that's true. Stuck on a desert island with only being able to achieve peer review or testing, I would choose peer review in an instant. Um, um, but the truth is the two are synergistic. It's not a matter of either or. It's, it's a matter of peer review helps your testing be used to greater effect. There are certain things you can test that it's very, very hard to perform peer review on. Race condition type, um, uh, type situations, or situations of network congestion and timeout where the temporal semantics associated with the code in the background are just not clear. And you can test things. There are certain types of sort of um, random case testing that you know, you're not going to be able to as easily reason about in a peer reviewed way. But peer reviews can also review test cases, right? They can review the tests you're going to be performing and help those tests go much, go further. Peer reviews can zero in on faults of a large number of parts that are hard to reproduce with testing. I mean, after all, you can peer review code you know, as to how it deals with out of memory errors or a missing file or what have you in a way that testing it might be awkward to perform. You have to set up the test environment to perform these or set test hooks, but peer review can find things. And it can use testing to greater effects. And so testing can also help identify issues for peer review. Like, right, why are we getting 
these failures in a certain area of the code in our tests? Why are we getting repeated occasional errors, perhaps hard to reproduce, occurring when we're using this, you know, this, this function which calls two others? And you can do peer review on that, reason through the code, and potentially find out why we're getting these failures. Um, or why we're getting this slow performance um, that comes out of testing. It identifies really slow performance occasional timeouts um, because of a you know, slow performance of an algorithm in this code. And you could undergo peer review to identify the algorithmic reasons underlying that or the dependencies. Maybe peer review, or excuse me, maybe testing identifies memory starvation. That sometimes this code is, is using gobs of memory. It's consuming gobs of memory. It's a huge memory footprint. And peer review can help you understand why. Is there a loose, is there a loose pointer, excuse me, is there a memory leak in here? Um, is it allocating here in a way that, um, you know, uh, it doesn't, doesn't lead it to be released later, et cetera. Um, so peer review can identify locking problem. You know, testing might identify a locking issue that leads to deadlock in a number of cases. And peer review can tease out the logical reason behind that and resolve it. So it's not that peer review is an alternative to testing. It's that peer review makes testing go further. It's, it focuses the testing on areas of greatest comparative strength and allows uh, that testing to, to achieve more. And peer review can be more effective because it can delegate some things to testing and it can allow testing to follow up and make sure that things operate as expected following uh, corrections from peer review. Peer review and testing, in short, are like two wings of a bird. They use in time. Don't try to fly with one wing. <laughs> Nor with zero. Okay? And with that, I will close. Thank you.